So by local Christian tradition, not, not only is this arch the place where the trial of Jesus took place, the place where he was presented to the public, but all of this is part of a holy path, a path from the side of his trial to the side of his execution, the Via Dolorosa. Shalom everyone, welcome to another vlog by Daniel the Digger. And this time in the quest of following Jesus in Jerusalem, I'm going to walk along Via Crucis. I'm going to walk along the stations of the cross and assess each station, analyze it. What is the tradition? What is the archeology span of each side has to say? Let's start. So actually the first station, believe it or not, and I hope you can hear me with this tractor cleaning up. Yes, cleaning is important. <laughs> This sign is telling us that this is a local Arab boys' school, but above it is a mark with the digit one, meaning this is the site of the first station. The school, believe it or not, is also the place where, oh, and I guess they're not gonna let me in right now. Inside this school is the place where the trial took place. At least this is what the medieval Catholic tradition is saying. And every Friday, uh, Franciscan monks will assemble it inside that courtyard, of course in the afternoon after the kids are home, and they will start the Friday procession, the Good Friday procession, from place of trial to place of crucifixion. The other side of this alley like their teacher is a bit upset. The other side of the alley has more clear Christian signs. Right here you can see the indication that this is the sanctuary of the flagellation and the condemnation. Brackets. The second station. Okay, this side is already a Catholic owned property with two chapels, one marking where Jesus is condemned to death and the other, the place where he steps out of the courtyard and is given the cross. From here, his journey begins from place of trial to place of execution. And going back on the street, of course today the pavement dates to the, well, middle plastic age, to the 20th century. But the claim is that it's built over pavement that goes all the way back to Roman times. And indeed, there are sections where one can see remains from Roman times, including the shop of Harut. Harut, Manishma. I want you to show me and the camera and the viewers the interior of your specific gift shop, souvenir shop, because it has here actually not only souvenirs and antiquities but bedrock and bedrock you know can mean uh, foundations from very very far back in time here you can see some of it and there's more that can be seen over here aha uh -huh. if you have bedrock at street level of today it means there was bedrock here also 2,000 years ago, and that implies, this is what the Christian tradition is, that on top of it stood a, a formidable building, a fortress. And indeed, we know from Josephus that at the northern end of the Temple Mount, Herod created a fortress name it, naming it Antonia. And the Catholic Christian medieval tradition says the Antonia is the site of the trial. Right, Harut? Yes. So this is the place of the trial of Jesus. Maybe not in your shop, no, but, but in this general location. compound. Yes. Right? That's quite a reward, Harut, to yes. have a shop over the place so the of where the trial of Jesus yes. took place. So the bedrock considered as a foundation from the Antonia Fortress, which means this is the north of the Temple Mount. Uh -huh. So this is really what's special. And as a family, 
we believe we are in mission in this area. This is why we like to share it with people. So when you visit Israel or Jerusalem, you are welcome to make a picture, to touch the wall, to make a prayer. And buy a rug. <laughs> or antiquities. Maybe we'll devote a different chapter to show daily life in Jerusalem, street life, and what you can buy in Jerusalem. But we are now on a different mission. Thank you, Arut. God, God bless, bless you. you. All the best. And we are going back to the street to continue the review of the Stations of the Cross. Yes, the first and the second station relate to the trial. And the third one will already be an event along his path as he walks towards the site of his execution. But before reaching the third station, there is another interesting site right over here. This arch above our heads is all part of what Christianity identifies with the Litos Stotos, the paved street area. I have reviewed this site alone in a different chapter. In so many words, the Christian claim is that this arch is part of the open courtyard. Hold on. This arch is part of the open courtyard uh, that is just next to the site of the trial, next to the Praetorium. And this is where Pilatus presented Jesus to the public, as presented in the Gospel of John. Heke homo, here is the man, he told them. And this is also the name of the arch discovered in the 19th century who would believe that where Jesus walked now you have scooters and cars and trucks passing by yes that's the reality here uh, the arch found in the 19th century and proven to be from Roman times was identified as where Jesus was presented to the public nowadays archaeology suggests that it actually dates to the time of Hadrian but it doesn't mean that the trial did not take place here where something earlier stood here. And if you're still not confused enough, here you have another site claiming to be the Praetorion, Praetorium, but it says it in Greek. And yes, this is the Greek Orthodox uh, version of the place of the trial of Jesus combined with Efulake to Christo, the prison of Christ. The claim is that this site is also the place where Jesus was imprisoned. But at the moment, it is close to the public. I hope when it reopens to present this site in detail as well. the municipality would update the cleaning the machines used for cleaning the city they are electric engines today they are electric carts and devices that can do all of this so much more quiet and so much less pollutive So, Eke Homo Arch, I like calling it station number 2.1, located in between the second and the third station. And I will agree that the layout of the alleys today does follow a grid established in Roman times. Jesus may have walked here, definitely not on this level. But if you go around the corner here, look what appears to us. <laughs> Border Patrol Police. Wait, I don't want to interfere the couple taking the photo. Border Patrol Police actually standing on original pavement right down here. Original pavement from 
uh, from Roman times. Okay, look at this. There's quite a lot of it down here. And the sign above is reminding us, yes, you are on the Via Dolorosa. You are along that holy path of the Stations of the Cross. And the sign over here is saying, this is already the third station. But a better, bigger and clearer sign appears over the corner. Right here. First of all, we've already learned that when you have these metal discs that look a bit like an Arab uh, plate to make pita bread, they're actually discs placed by the municipality to mark that there is a station and which one is it. In addition, you also have here a relief that is showing the subject of the station, the falling of Jesus from the weight of the cross, an event that is not really documented in the Gospels. But you know what? Half of the stations of the stations of the cross are not from the Gospels directly. They are more like Catholic traditions. And indeed, the sign around it in fading orange is telling us that the third station is under the custody of the Armenian Catholic Patriarchate. It is sadly closed right now, but when they will open, I will do a more presentation of each station in detail. What does it contain? What is the history of it? The politics sometimes, often in fact. And most interesting, what is the archaeology of it? In comfortable proximity to the third station, I mean it's right next to it, here you have the plot for the fourth station, the fourth station where Mary saw Jesus, a woman seeing her son carrying a cross could only mean one thing, he's about to be put to death. This station is devoted to Stabat Mater, to the agony, to the crying mother realizing her son is about to die. Beautiful classic music was written about this subject, but I hate to say it, the Gospels do not record this event, and definitely not here. All of these stations, placing them at certain locations are, are based heavily on certain traditions, and the marks are both the municipality round disc, in 2020 or maybe 21, like recently, they added also reliefs or engaged sculpture, I don't know how to call this, that present those subjects. Mary and Jesus appearing here. Mary, uh, Jesus falling from the weight of the cross up uh, there. I'll try and zoom in. Hope you can see it. And on top of it, you also have in most of the stations at least, marks on the floor. These black basalt stones set in a uh, semicircle are another way to indicate here is another uh, station. Okay, so that was the fourth station. Let's move on. Here, in a fantastic way, the Via Dolorosa actually merges with one of the main commercial streets of the Muslim quarter of the old city. Yes, we are in the Muslim quarter at the same time that we are along a holy Christian path. It's also the Muslim quarter. <laughs> okay, I don't understand a word in Arabic, but it sounded like a Muslim kind of preaching. <laughs> Maybe I better not know Arabic for this part. Um, so this is the main street that offers a fantastic combination of 
souvenirs, antiquities. It is legal to buy antiquities in Israel. There are quite a few antiquity shops along this path. Uh, all sorts of what looks to me like cheap import from China. T-shirts with various signs. Okay, this is an amazing combination. On one hand, a t-shirt kind of laughing at the Israeli defense force saying my job is so secret I don't even know what I'm doing and beneath it a sign for Palestine and above it America don't worry Israel is behind you. <laughs> amazing combinations. Oh, okay, sorry. It's, it's to promote your shop. Okay. Okay, and right next to it the fifth station. The fifth station again, the mark here telling us it's the fifth station, Via Dolorosa, the relief depicting the subject. And what is the subject? Simoni Kireneo Crux Imponito, the place where Simon of Kirenaica helped Jesus to carry the cross. Yes, this event is documented in the Gospels. Uh, of course, saying that it happened here, as also you have the mark on the floor, that's already a matter of good guesswork. But they usually show the pilgrims this indentation in the wall, saying this is where Jesus leaned against the wall as he realized that he now has to ascend up towards the heel of his cruci crucifixion. Now, if I lean against the wall, well, nothing happens. But I'm not the son of God. He leaned against the wall and look, an indentation in the form of a left hand appeared in the rock, proving this is it. This is this location. And again, sadly, the chapel itself is closed. I do hope that it will open soon. I will probably then do another vlog of each station and its interior and story in greater detail. Now, one cannot should not miss also the unofficial Holy Humus station <laughs> next to the fifth station. This is the famous Humus joint of Abu Shukri. Abu Shukri is perhaps the most famous brand name for Humus in the old city. He's not the only one anymore, but in the 1970s, he was possibly the only one, definitely the most famous one. Okay, our journey continues and we now ascend heading west, heading towards what used to be in the first century the gate of the city, as the execution is said to have been on a hill, it doesn't even say hill, on a site called Golgotha, which was outside city wall. Here kitty kitty. Hey, hello. How are you? <laughs> So heading west now and going up, the tradition is that we are headed towards the gate of the city. And then beyond it, a short distance brings you to the site of the crucifixion. I must add on a personal level, it's sad to see <laughs> how so many shops are closed. This is still during the raging pandemic. We're actually in the midst of the Omicron wave of infection, but the uh, morning report was very optimistic, saying in a week or two, numbers are going to start declining, and the skies are already open. So hopefully, with the pandemic under control, with the Omicron, maybe, hopefully, God willing, literally, God, I hope you'll be willing to make this the last wave of the pandemic, and we'll start seeing tourists here again. And when they will come, they will also see this sign marking the sixth station. The sixth station appearing here on the wall as well. And the sign above it tells us the story in Arabic. But if your Arabic is not good enough, you can practice here your 
Latin. Sixth station, where Pia Veronica Faciem Christi Lintio de Terci. This is, this is the site where Pius Veronica, the face of Christ with a lintel, with a napkin, she wiped. Okay, what is this story? Is it from the New Testament? Again, it's not. It's a Catholic tradition. And here are the marks above it. That metal disc again and the relief next to it, and the marking on the floor. So yes, now you have clear marks that this is the site, but I'm sorry, it's not even mentioned in the New Testament. And saying that it happened here, well, it's anyone's guess. The building itself might look nice and interesting, but it is from the 19th century, not before. What is the claim of this site? The claim, the Catholic claim, is that this is where Jesus, going up this hill, was bleeding, was sweating, and a woman called Veronica approached him from her house and cleaned the sweat off his face. The miracle adds that then an imprint of his face appeared on her scarf. She created actually an imprint of the face of Jesus. Veronica, they say, is maybe for Vera Icona, creating the true image of Jesus, and that forms the sixth station. Alan Khabibi, how are you? When you're walking along the Via Dolorosa, you can also get some good, fresh orange juice, pomegranate juice, lemon. Actually, the best is a combination of them. And of course, don't miss some good Arabic coffee, right? <laughs> of course, this is from two minutes ago. It's not fresh anymore. Make sure to get a good fresh cup of coffee and refresh yourself as you walk along this holy path. <laughs> and if you're into magnets, oh my God. There's so many of them both political ones, religious ones, Zionistic ones. <laughs> Anyone can, even Druze ones. Anyone can pick his favorite. One good thing that was just recently completed is repaving this part of the Via Dolorosa. The road was still modern. I mean, there was nothing here really ancient, but it was not in good condition. It was weathering out. And at least the municipality used the pandemic, used the opportunity to fix the road. Not, <coughs> not only is it uh, more smooth now, it's even designed that people in wheelchair can be carried along this path. It's still a quite an angle, but it is possible. Before, it was literally impossible for people you know, um, that are restricted or, or children and toddlers. It was so much more difficult to take them along this path. Okay, here is the seventh station. The seventh station marked here both by that disc the sign and the relief and again the door is closed <laughs> but when it will open maybe it is open no when it will open and i will be able to present the interior here you have actually something quite interesting an original roman era column in its position meaning it is marking a certain original item from Roman times. Now, the claim is that that pillar was already outside city walls, meaning somewhere around here or somewhere around here was the city gate. Nowadays, archaeology suggests that actually this is a column of the later Roman period when the city was repaved, redesigned as Elia Capitolina, and that column is one of many that were placed here 
uh, marking the Cardo Maximus, the main avenue of the city. Now remember I told you about Abu Shukri famous hummus? So here is competition. <laughs> another good hummus joint, another place for a light lunch stop. I will definitely do also a vlog of street food, daily life and shopping opportunities in the old city of Jerusalem. It's hidden gems and special places. Hello, how are you? <laughs> My name is Manishma. This is vlogging about the Via Dolorosa, the Stations of the Cross. And here we are reaching the, see the sign, the Eighth Station. The Eighth Station by, cut by the local tradition is already outside city walls, yes? Up to this point, we've been walking inside the city. At this stage, we are outside the city, about to reach the Golgotha. The Golgotha is inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is behind this wall. And here, tradition says, Jesus saw the women of Jerusalem. This is documented in the Gospels. It doesn't say the exact location, but you could argue that it happened close to the heel of the crucifixion. The municipality again added a metal disc with the right digit. And the claim is that this site has been venerated since antiquity because of the mark here telling us for centuries this is the spot. You have here actually a Roman column Recycled, yes, it's one of a few that were recycled. No, no tourists. We're still waiting for the tourists, my friend. This is another option where you can get written material about the Via Dolorosa, about the city of Jerusalem. Uh, I think his most popular item on sale here is a little pamphlet for like five shekels of all the stations and what each one stands for. And like me and everyone else, we're waiting for the tourists to come back. <laughs> but here is the mark of the eighth station. And as I started saying, this wall is all part of a 19th century Greek Orthodox monastery. But the claim is that this mark is indicating this is the place where the women of Jerusalem saw Jesus. The the signs here are a cross and above it, Isos Christos Nika, Jesus Christ Conquer. Okay, now, because of the 19th century Greek Orthodox monastery, we actually need to make a U-turn. And I always like posing this to the tourists. What, he got lost? Why did he go back? No, of course, it is a U-turn today because the path from the Eighth Station and to the Golgotha is, well, blocked. It's also worth noting that there's a German institution here reminiscent of the Hospitallers and the Crusaders period when the city was all controlled by <laughs> Catholic warriors of the Middle Ages. Uh, Templars, Hospitallers, Tevtonians, you name it. The city had a completely different character in the days. Maybe not so much the layout. The layout of the city was quite similar to its layout today, but you had here mostly, or should I say only, uh, Christians. Here's another unofficial holy station, the station of the coffee grinder. This is where you can get, oh my God, I wish you could see the smell. Can I take a photo of the beans? Look at this. <laughs> this is before they are grinded. And then the final product is sold in here. And if only the camera could deliver the smell, the fresh smell of fresh grinded coffee. Hallelujah. Okay, but we are here again on a different mission. Eager not to disturb the locals doing their shopping. We are now walking through the busiest part of the old city, believe it or not. 
but we are still along the Stations of the Cross. Yes, you see here the shops are offering um, toys, are offering textiles. This is not what pilgrims come here for. So it's, it's not for the pilgrims. It's the local hardware items like here that people living in Jerusalem will be in need. And yet, when you do have tourism, you can have Catholic groups, some of them carrying a big wooden cross along this path as well. I know it's amazing, but yes, that is what makes Jerusalem so special. That also. Okay, Gucci, Gucci, anyone? Made in China Gucci? It's original, of course it's original. It's a, it was originally made in some house in China. Yes, sir, I'm helping you. Hello. Where are you from? Uh, I'm not sure anymore. I am coming out. Ah, if you want to get a hamsa. These are items to wart and protect you uh, from right. the evil eye. That's right. And look, there is no evil eye in the shop. You see, we it works. Inside. <laughs> Come inside. Take a look. So when I am going out of business in my store. Oh, Maybe we're all going like out of business. Something. We're all going out of business. In Abu Dhabi, But when the tourists will come back, look how many items they can buy. On one hand, if you want Judaica, you can get. A menorah, a Hanukkiah. If you want, if you want Christian items, look at this. You also have olive woodworks presenting subjects like the Nativity. Okay, or just a wooden cross. Okay, and how much? Ten shekels, twenty shekels. How much is a shekel? Americans don't know. Five dollars, you know. Five dollars, ten dollars. The $2. Just the show up. <laughs> <laughs> and he's one of the few that is actually open, as we saw before. Many shops don't even care to open. What you want to sell is something now. I really <laughs> believe that this <laughs> is going to change soon. We're all waiting for the tourists. <laughs> he thought he would make a sale. I'm sorry. Get some shoes. Oh, another noisy, polluting diesel engine tractor passing by. <coughs> Want to get some fresh lemonade? Ah, uh -huh, This also comes with mint. Where are the pomegranates? Rimonim. And Rimonim. It's not the pomegranate season. This guy usually has a lot of pomegranates making good fresh pomegranate juice. But he's also located, believe it or not, along the twist in the path, the holy path. And this shop, believe it or not, actually has in its warehouse, in, in its back, the original entrance into the church of the Holy Sepulcher. The first church built in the fourth century its main entry was from here. It was connected to the stage, to the Cardo Maximus. Let me zoom out so I can show it. It was connected to what used to be a 22 meter wide avenue stretching all the way from Mount Zion to Damascus Gate. Okay, we know so because of sources both historical sources and especially the Madaba map, which presents it very clearly. Nowadays, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is about a fourth of its original size. And in order to reach it, as well as the ninth station, we're actually going to go now on rooftops of buildings before reaching the current entrance into the church. But one thing is significant. We are now switching from the Muslim quarter to the Christian quarter. And this is the first Christian institution. I don't know if you can read the language there. This is Russian. This is indeed a Russian uh, owned property named after a Russian hero, Russian Christian hero called 
Alexander Nevsky, built in the 19th century when it was constructed, they found more evidence of the Cardo Maximus, but they attributed it again to the days of Jesus. And furthermore, they found also architecture that was suggested to be uh, either of the first, fourth century church, or maybe, maybe even a Roman temple that once stood there. Uh, a Roman temple that is mentioned in Christian sources like Eusebius and Hieronymus, St. Jerome. I should, I will make a different chapter about the Nevsky church and its archaeology later on, but focusing on the stations of the cross, you can see that now we're passing by Christian institutions. The Jerusalem cross and the Greek writing is the clear proof of this. And here, you can see for the first time the two domes hovering over the tomb of Jesus and uh, the site of the crucifixion, the Golgotha. Golgotha is the name of the site of the execution. It's an Aramaic word which means skull. So you might know the site as Skull Hill, but the Greek original text of the story labels it Golgotha, providing the Aramaic name of the site. Look how it gets so much more quiet all of a sudden. But here is another souvenir shop, this time completely devoted to Christian memorabilia. Again, olive wood works, which are really local. They're made in workshops in the West Bank from local olive trees. Not sure about the origin of the other items, but they're all uh, popular items that people like purchasing, especially in the Eastern churches. They like getting bundles of these 33 candles, which will be lit inside the church, each candle marking a year in the life of Jesus. But we are looking for the ninth station, where is it? Aha, you see the sign there? Here is the last mark outside the church, the ninth station, the place where Jesus fell from the weight of the cross again for the third time. His first fall was the third station, second at the seventh, and this is the third and final fall before reaching the site of his execution. This area is maintained by the Coptic Orthodox Patriarchate. The Coptics are the Christians of Egypt, one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. And they have both the main church over here. They also control a smaller chapel that is giving, paying tribute to Queen Helen. Queen Helen is, of course, Helena Augusta, the mother of Constantine, the one probably to convince him to embrace Christianity. And then she comes here on a holy journey, and this image is showing one of her most significant achievements, tracking, finding parts of wood which were associated with the cross. The discovery of the true cross was made by Helena Augusta and is marked right here underground, inside the church. The church itself is a spectacular place and it is worthy of quite a few uh, vlogs. I did actually get a chance recently to review uh, a Catholic procession inside check it out, as well as an ability to get into the tomb, the actual tomb of Jesus, as identified by Helena or acknowledged by her. It's usually a place with a long line to get in, and the monks don't really let you even take a photo, but for some reason there was no one there 
forbidding me from videoing for a few minutes the interior of the tomb of Jesus. So make sure you to watch that as well. This is now stopping over these architectural remains which are actually significant because they indicate that the Crusaders built this part of the church. This is called an elbow capital stretching out of the wall and if you don't believe me then look at this little image of the fleur de lis clear symbol of the crusaders and their period so once upon a time there was a colonnaded courtyard over here nowadays underground is held by the armenians this part by the coptics as we said and now i'm going to walk through two ethiopian chapels who knows maybe there'll be a procession inside let's check it out This is a very interesting image inside the Ethiopian chapel presenting the visit of Queen Sheba who came to see King Solomon. This event is documented in the Old Testament in the Book of Kings but what is not described in the Book of Kings but they believe in the Ethiopian church is that they also had more than wine or maybe wine is what caused it. And nine months later, Queen of Sheba gave birth to a child, a child of Solomon, whose name was Menelik. And Solomon prepared him to spread the worship of God also in Ethiopia. And for that matter, he also uh, created a, a replica of the ark that he would take with him to Ethiopia except that Menelik fooled him. Okay, thanks. Menelik fooled him and swapped the replica with the real Ark and took it to Ethiopia. So where is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, by Ethiopian tradition, they have it in Aksum, except that they won't let anyone see it. So there's no way of validating this tradition. And if you're fond of this topic, I do urge you to check out my series about tracking the locations of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy Land. When it was in the Holy Land, it, the, the Old Testament describes a few locations of where it was kept before placed in Solomon's temple. And I went to each and every site and covered uh, its history and archeology. span You'll be surprised that some of these sites contain very, very significant evidence that relates to where the ark was placed. But we are now on a different mission. We have seen the ninth station. And let's move on to finally reach the church, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Is the place for the, all the last five stations. Okay, this is another chapel maintained by the Ethiopians, although its construction in both cases is clearly from the time of the Crusaders. Let's get adjusted to the sunlight. Ooh. Here we go. So this is the known entry to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And not many people notice the fact that there is a column over here. Wherever you have a column in the old city, especially along the Stations of the Cross, it could have a significance. And this is no exception. This one is marking the place where Jesus is stripped from his clothes and then taken up to the site of the
crucifixion. The tenth station. And now let's step inside. You see the remaining stations all inside the church. Starting with a climb up to the Golgotha. Here we go. I can hear that there's a procession going on right now. I hope I'll be able to film in all locations. Here we go. Oops. Okay. 11th station. And I'm going to do a total uh, set of reviews of the church. But just to complete the stations of the cross, the 11th station where Jesus is hammered to the cross, as this image is presenting. Over here, the site of the crucifixion itself, the 12th station. You can see the bedrock proving that there was a hill projecting over the street level around here. And in between, kind of puzzling the, the pilgrim, the 13th station is actually in the middle, between the 11th and the 12th, the place where Mary stood, watching Jesus dying on the cross, feeling a pain equal to a sword piercing her body, which was also predicted earlier in the Gospels. So this is said to be where Mary stood when she saw Jesus dying on the cross. Here are all of these three stations now combined. And this event happening on Friday in the morning ends by the afternoon with the death of Jesus. The family takes him off the cross. The last station, the tomb itself. Now, in between the 13th and the 14th station, there is another unofficial station, but a popular stop. It is called the Stone of Unction, the place where the body of Jesus was ointed and prepared for the burial. And look at the people, how they are putting their items over it. So these items will be blessed, being placed over the site, the very place where the body of Jesus was laid. That is quite a meaningful spot. And here in the back, you can see Wait, let me zoom in. A, a wall mosaic that is very helpful to explain the sequence of events. The body of Jesus is taken off the cross. It is then prepared for burial. The nails are pull, pulled out. The body is ointed. And it is taken to burial. And what does the burial look like today? We will end with this grand image of the edicula, the giant dome above, and inside the tomb. I'm not sure I'll be able to go inside. Maybe I can. Oh my god. Maybe I can. So here we go. This is the tomb itself. Absolutely no one inside. I can't believe it's working again. There's no one inside that I can film the interior of this place. Let's see if I can get my light out.
is the interior, all covered up, but the most significant part of it archaeologically is something discovered recently when this site was renovated. This is bedrock. This is bedrock proving that this was This is bedrock proving. Okay, I have to go. Bye bye.